Just off the coast lies a fish with an impressive physique. Those who see it for the first time are amazed by its elegant and mesmerizing fin display. And although it's hard to argue their beauty, there is one problem. These fish are not supposed to be here. Lionfish are native to the Indo-Pacific, which is about as far away from here, on Earth, as you can get. A measly few lionfish from the aquarium market made it into local waterways a few decades ago. Today, they are here off North Florida, as well as throughout the Western Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico. And they are here not only as a few isolated individuals, but in plague-like congregations. Lionfish are considered Florida's most prolific marine invasive species. It's likely that the invasion started sometime in the mid-1980s. That's when the first reported sighting was of lionfish, just north of Miami. My name is Eric Johnson. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of North Florida. I work in fisheries biology, and one of my uh, subjects of expertise is invasive species. Well, lionfish really are sort of the perfect storm. Uh, I think in many ways, as invasive species goes, they have a lot of characteristics which make them very successful in, in the invaded range. They are habitat generalists. They reproduce very early in life. They grow very rapidly. They're capable of dispersing uh, large distances during their egg and larval phase. So you've got an animal that's easily adapted to a lot of things, has novel ways of hunting prey. Animals are herding and spitting water jets and things that native animals have never seen before. Most evidence suggests that relatively few things that can eat them do eat them. All of those things sort of put together mean that it's a species that, that's able to succeed. You have an animal that can, once it invades, um, can really increase in population numbers very rapidly. They're eating a whole variety of, of our native species, and so you're going to see impacts potentially on multiple levels. Um, for one, they're removing prey that would have been available for many of our native fish stocks. Um, they're also certainly having a direct predatory impact on many of those small reef fishes. And while we don't fish for those species, those species perform important ecological services on the reef. Uh, many of them are uh, herbivorous fish that maintain uh, algal crops at low density. Uh, many of these other species are cleaner species, so many of the shrimps and gobies and things uh, perform services by removing parasites from some of the larger fish. So removing those um, those species can have an impact. Lionfish are eating many things and they are voracious consumers. They can drive down densities of these fish species very rapidly on these reefs. Today, a team of conservation divers are heading offshore to capture lionfish. Their goal, to remove as many of the invaders as their safe underwater dive times will allow. I'm going out lionfish bashing. I'm gonna catch them with a pole spear. I've got a pole spear and I'm going to put them in a zookeeper and, you know, get as many as I possibly can. There's a lot on the bottom, I understand. They are really bad. They're bad for all the reefs. They're eating our little fish. Well, the, the little fish that become big fish, they're eating our grouper. They're eating everything. They're, they're a disaster on our reef system. Uh, we just, we need to get them rid of as many as possible. The targeted hunting grounds consist of natural and artificial reefs 20 to 30 miles off the coast. These sites are the preferred habitats of lionfish. As expected, there are no shortage of lionfish below, and divers go to work. The majority use a pole spear, as it has proven to be the most effective way to maximize harvest yields. few divers attempt a live capture, but the technique quickly confirms to be an inefficient harvest method. Back aboard the vessel, hunters fillet a few of the harvested lionfish to prepare fresh ceviche, a tasty benefit from a day's worth of productive work. Once ashore, we decided to take a closer look at the day's catch. Okay, so what are we doing here, Mary-Kate, with this big old fish? Okay, so the first thing that I usually do is take the length. So total length is going to be all the way to the end of the tail. And on this fish, it is about 366 millimeters. This one is about 700 grams. We're gonna actually go ahead and, and open this up and see 
what's in the gut content of the fish itself to get an idea of the type of fish it's eating here. Mainly we're looking to see if it's a boy or a girl and what's in the stomach, so that's how you do it right here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take out the stomach. We've went ahead, we've, we've looked at what was inside the stomach, that was this thing here. It's pretty gnarly. Um, we found out it was a male, here are some boy parts. And we also <laughs> opened the head and found the otoliths, which are the ear bones. And I suppose a lot of research can be determined from Yeah, people the information. use otoliths for all different kinds of things, not just aging. But. And so now we're left with the meat, which is actually really good. So we'll fillet this up and uh, make a few sandwiches out of it. Today was a lionfish removal tournament event where several boats full of divers were offshore harvesting. And the tournament has been a great success in educating the public, getting people to come out and learn about lionfish, to try some lionfish for the first time. It's a really exciting event to be a part of. At the day's end ceremony, all the lionfish were reviewed and categorized. Prizes were awarded for the participants who removed the most lionfish. The lionfish captured that were not consumed were donated for research. 276 total length and 184 standard length. Our research program on lionfish here in sort of northeastern Florida is trying to characterize a lot of the life history traits uh, of lionfish. So we're looking at things like how fast do they grow, uh, how many times do they reproduce, how many eggs do they produce. We're looking at trophic impacts, so by that I mean diet, so what these animals are eating. So we bring the fish back to the laboratory, we take out the stomach and we identify the prey items that are, that are found within so we can get an idea of what these fish are eating and how it changes seasonally. It smells wonderful. It's like the eyeball, cornea oh, wow. maybe or something, hard to say. Um, but obviously here's some fish skin. You can see why many of the items we get are not readily identifiable by eye. So looking at the size, that fish was probably at least three or four inches when it was eaten. And this fish is close to 12, maybe 13 inches. So lionfish can take in prey almost half their body size. Uh, we remove their otoliths, which are ear bones. They tell us a lot about the age of the fish, so similar to tree rings. They're like the black box in, a, in an airplane. They record sort of the life history of the fish, and so there's a huge amount of, of information contained within those biological samples. So we've fully processed this fish. We've taken its measurements, its length, and its weight, and we've taken a variety of biological samples. We've removed uh, the otoliths from the cranial cavity, from their position just behind the brain. Uh, we've opened this fish up to uh, look inside. Here were the, the prey contents here. So uh, one larger fish, not visually identifiable, we'll send this guy off to the Smithsonian lab where they'll give us a positive identification on species. Uh, we've removed uh, the gonads. This is a female fish. Uh, so these are the ovaries uh, filled, uh, filled with eggs. Uh, and we've taken a fillet sample uh, from um, the dorsal left side of the fillet for use in our mercury analyses. I think right now the best strategy we have for controlling the fish is human consumption. So if we can increase um, the amount harvested uh, through a variety of ways, uh, increase demand for this species in both seafood markets, increase uh, demand in terms of restaurants to get restaurants to carry it, then I think things start to fall into place. So if the public can ask for it, can demand it, it's a delicious fish, then uh, the restaurants will carry it and uh, they'll have, the fishermen will, if there's a market for it, they'll, they'll go out and get it.